Welcome to Making a Murderer, Rubber Ducky YouTube channel. All right, you guys, thank, thank you very much for joining me as we start, pay, uh, geez, I can't talk today, day four. And we're going to do our Daily Ma'am reading, and it's part 14 today. Page 131, Type of Activity Supplemental Report, Date of Activity 110705. Reporting Officer Sergeant Bill Tyson. Upon reporting to the crime scene on Monday, 11.07.05, I, Sergeant Tyson, was informed that my duty for the morning would be to work with Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Andrew Colborn. I was informed they did wish for us to open the trunks on all remaining vehicles on the property, and after that was completed, enter all residences and collect all firearms. We began our search for any vehicles that did not have the trunks opened at Steve Avery's residence. We did not locate any vehicles on that property that did not have their trunk, have access to their trunk area. We proceeded to Barb Yonda's residence and did locate a blue 1990 Chevy Chevrolet Caprice four door with no registration plates. The VIN was 1G1BL5470LR144158. Sergeant Colborn did enter Barbara's residence because he said he searched her trailer the day before and noticed there was a large number of car keys. We decided to attempt to use the keys inside the house to see if any of these trunks could be opened without forcibly having to open them. Sergeant Colborn did enter Barbara's residence at 0803 hours and did come back out at approximately 0805 hours. Sergeant Colborn did have a handful of keys and we did attempt to open the trunk of a Chevrolet Caprice but was unsuccessful with any of the keys he had located. Sergeant Colborn did have to use a crowbar to forcibly enter the trunk of the Chevrolet Caprice. No items of interest were located inside the Chevrolet Caprice. There was also a white-colored Pontiac Fiero with no registration plates marked parked on Barbara Yonda's property. The vehicle did have a VIN number of 1G2AM37R2EP320356. Once again, none of the keys that Sergeant Colborn located would fit the trunk carry for this vehicle. At approximately 0817 hours, the trunk was forcibly opened by the use of a crowbar. After remaining units, all remaining units on Barbionda's property were hatchbacks or van, which we could see the interior of without having to damage the vehicle to look inside. We then moved our search to all the vehicles that were parked in the fenced-in area by the Blue Metal Building, located north of the salvage yard. Forcible entry was made to the following vehicles. 1 a black Pontiac bearing Wisconsin registration 701-CKK with a VIN 1G2WJ14 T3LF254289. Forcible entry was made at 0845 hours. Number two, a maroon Chrysler with no registration tag with a VIN 1B3BZ18ZSHD675416. Forcible entry was made at 0847 hours. Page 132. Number 3. A red Ford Mustang bearing Wisconsin registration 411-CER with a VIN 1FACP40A0 LF160993. Forcible entry was made at 0852 hours. Number 4. A brown Ford Taurus bearing Wisconsin registration 608-8BD with a VIN 1FABP 52U1JG213653. Forcible entry was made at 0854 hours. Number 5. A red for a Thunderbird with no registration plate with a VIN 1FAB P64T3JH123988. Forcible entry was made at 0901 hours. Sergeant Colborn, Lieutenant Link, and I searched the outbuildings and did locate numerous vehicles parked inside the outbuildings. Most of the vehicles did have the keys in the vehicle. 
which did allow us to access the trunk area. Forcible entry did have to be made to a Chevrolet with no registration plate that had the VIN of 1L69G9 J320089. Forcible entry also had to be made to a blue Chevrolet Monte Carlo two door, which bore Wisconsin's registration 926 GJL and had a VIN of 1G1G237ZAFR151577. It should be noted Sergeant Colborn used a crowbar and a screwdriver to gain entries into the trunk areas of these vehicles. I did receive a telephone call from Investigator Weegert requesting we re-enter Stephen Avery's residence to obtain the serial number of the computer that was located under the computer desk in the living room. At 0957 hours, Sergeant Colborn, Lieutenant Link, and I entered Stephen Avery's residence and did obtain the information that Investigator Weegert requested. I did televate telephone investigator Wiegert from Steve Avery's residence and inform him the computer was a Hewitt Packard HP pavilion model that had a system number of PP16588-ABA and a serial number of MXK5040MXH. Upon giving investigator Wiegert that information, we did exit Steve Avery's residence at 10.04 hours. Sergeant Colburn Lieutenant Link and I continued our duties and entered Barbara Yonda's residence at 10.07 hours with the intent to remove all firearms and ammunition from the residence. The following is a list of firearms and ammunition seized from Barb Yonda's residence. 1. A Sturm Ruger .223 caliber firearm with a serial number of 196-54277. The firearm had a bushnell scope and had an ammunition clip that was loaded with three rounds. Also with the firearm was a partial box of .223 caliber rounds. This item was located in the master bathroom closet in its black plastic case. The firearm was collected by Sergeant Colborn at 1012 hours. Number two, an unloaded 12 gauge Mossberg shotgun with a 24-inch rifle, rifled barrel, serial number L303680. With the firearm were two partial boxes of ammunition. Box number one was a 12-gauge rifled Federal slug. Box two was a Rottweil Brenke MP70 millimeter rounds. This item was collected by Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Link at 10.15 hours and was located in the master bedroom closet. Page 133. Number 3. A 30-odd 6 semi-automatic Remington Woodmaster firearm, model number 742, serial number 42165. The firearm had a Simon scope with a leather sling. This item was located in the master bedroom gun cabinet and was seized by Sergeant Colborn and Lieutenant Link at 1025 hours. Number 4. A bolt action Mauser, model number Argentino 1909, serial number L6654, unknown caliber. This item was located in the master bedroom gun cabinet and was seized by Sergeant Colborn and Lieutenant Link at 1031 hours. Number 5. A 16-gauge, single-shot, bridge gun corporate, shotgun serial number 81006417. This item was found in the gun cabinet located in the master bedroom and was seized by Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn at 1034 hours. This item was placed in a gray plastic gun case that was found in the bedroom closet. Number 6. A 22 caliber bolt action Marlin rifle serial number 07644931. The rifle had a Simon scope and was found in the gun cabinet in the master bedroom. This item was seized by Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn at 1036 hours. 7. A 50 caliber Connecticut Valley Arms muzzle loader. Model Hawkins Rifle Black Powder Muzzle Loader, serial number 6013698595. This item was found in the gun cabinet, which was located in the master bedroom. 
This item was seized by Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn at 10.38 hours. Number 8. A 16-gauge bolt-action J.C. Higgins shotgun, model number 583-21. No serial number was available. Also included with that firearm was 12-gauge, 28-inch, bent-ribbed shotgun barrel. This item was located in the gun cabinet in the master bedroom and was seized by Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn at 1040 hours. Number 9. A 22 caliber Miami, Florida, GFI revolver handgun, model number M80 Western Ranger. Included with this item were miscellaneous ammunition and one empty magazine for a Marlin rifle. This item was located in the gun cabinet in the master bedroom and was seized by Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn at 1046 hours. Number 10. A bag of miscellaneous ammunition, which was found in the gun cabinet in the master bedroom. Along with the ammunition was an empty magazine for the ammunition. These items were seized by Sergeant Colburn at 1048 hours. As we finished collecting the firearms from the master bedroom, I received a phone call indicating we needed to leave Barb Yonda's residence and respond to Cuss Road for a suspicious incident. Lieutenant Link, Sergeant Colburn, and I left Barb Yonda's residence at 10.58 hours. After clearing from the suspicious incident, we did go back to Barb Yonda's residence to finish collecting firearms from the residence. At 14.50 hours, Sergeant Colburn, Lieutenant Link, and I entered Barb Yonda's residence. Additional firearms collected from the residence include Page 134 Number 11 A 12-gauge pump shotgun, no model number, serial number L32598. This item was located in its tan-colored zippered case and was collected by Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Link at 14.50, two hours. Number 12, a 22 caliber semi-automatic Marlin rifle, model number 60 SSK with a BSA scope, serial number 01091639. This item was located in the west bedroom and collected by Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Link at 1454 hours. Number 13, also collected from that bedroom was a box of 30-06 federal rounds. We did locate a stack of on gun safe in the basement of Barb Yonder's residence, although we could not gain entry into the safe without causing damage. Sergeant Colburn was able to shake the safe and he informed me it felt empty to him. I did make a notation we would attempt to get the combination for that safe as to avoid causing damage to the stack on safe. Our search for firearms had ended and we exited Barb Yonder's residence at 15.08 hours. After clearing from Barb Yonder's residence, we were notified the Wisconsin State Crime Lab was on scene on Cuss Road. We were requested to come back to the area to assist the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Upon our arrival, the potential area of suspicion had been blocked off by a crime scene tape, and I did check in with Investigator Dietering. I notified him that Sergeant Colburn, Lieutenant Lincoln, and I would be entering the crime scene area to assist Wisconsin State Crime Lab. It shall be noted this was an area that was discovered earlier in the day by search volunteers who had located an area approximately three feet by three feet that appeared to be disturbed soil. After the f photography by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab was completed, Lieutenant Link, Sergeant Colburn, and I began digging up the area and quickly found out this was not a possible or burial site. Upon reporting those findings to Investigator Dietering, the crime scene tape had been removed and the area was reopened. Sergeant Bill Tyson, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 135. Type of Activity, Supplemental Report. Date of Activity, 110705. Reporting Officer, Investigator Wendy Baldwin. On 11.07.05, at approximately 8.50 a.m., I, Investigator Wendy Baldwin, met with personnel from the Michigan Fire Department, who had brought their jaws and cutting tools to assist with opening the crushed vehicles in the pit area. We started cutting open the vehicles at approximately 8.50 a.m. and concluded at approximately 12.20 p.m. Approximately 54 vehicles were opened by means of having the roof cut off and searched. However, nothing was found. 
At approximately 13.15 hours, I was requested to stand by the garbage burn barrel at Steve Avery's house until evidence technicians arrived on scene. I did stand by with this until approximately 15.39 hours when the barrel was recovered by Calumet County Sheriff's Department Deputy Lynn Masuzak. After completing that, I did assist with searching the field northwest of Stephen Avery's property. At approximately 1,900 hours, Assistant District Attorney Jeff Froelich, Detective Dennis Jacobs from Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, and I made contact with the Honorable Judge Fox at his residence. Honorable Judge Fox did sign the search warrant for the computer of Steve Avery and for the DNA collection of the following people. Ellen Avery, Brian Dassey, Charles Avery, Bobby Dassey, Dolores Avery, Barbara Jonda, Earl Avery, Stephen Avery. Those search warrants were signed, and I signed them as received, and they were turned over to Investigator Mark Weigert. Investigator Wendy Baldwin, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 136. Type of activity, contact with Michelle J. Kinzelberger. Date of activity 110705. Reporting officer, Investigator John Deering. Documents generated, none. On Monday, 110705 at 1028 hours. I, Deering, did make contact with the following individual by telephone regarding this matter. Ms. Michelle J. Kanzelberger. I had made contact with Ms. Kanzelberger as a result of information given to me by Detective Inspector Shatter. Kanzelberger indicated she had been engaged to Earl Avery for two years and that the relationship was from 1987 to 1989. She stated she lived on the Avery land during the weekend and was very familiar with the property. She indicated she would be willing to assist the investigators in any way she could regarding any sort of historical information and geographical layout. One thing I did find, inter find of interest was that Mrs. Kanslingerberger indicated that Stephen Avery was not the only family member capable of this sort of behavior. Investigation continues. Investigator John Deering, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 137. Type of activity. Information developed regarding possible items of interest on Cuss Road. Date of activity, 110705. Reporting officer, Investigator John Deering. Documents generated, none. On Monday, 110705 at 1035 hours. I. Deering was contacted by Investigator Weigert. He requested an investigator go to the east end of Cuss Road. I did respond to the area and spoke with retired De De Deputy Inspector Michael Bushman, Mantuac County Sheriff's Department. Bushman was leading a team of searchers in the area. It should be noted that the end of Cuss Road is approximately one half mile away from the western edge of the Avery property. I arrived at the east end of Cuss Road at approximately 1045 hours and spoke with former Deputy Inspector Bushman. He indicated he had found a possible excavation site and did take us to the site. The area was then tarp taped off with crime scene tape and area was frozen. No one was allowed in or out. The possible excavation area was processed by Wisconsin State Crime Lab personnel and at 1651 hours, I was notified the excavation area was not pertinent to the case. GPS coordinates for this area were in 44 degree, 15.263, and west 87 degrees, 42.031. Investigation continues. Investigator John Teetering, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 138. Type of activity, supplemental report. Date of activity, 110705. Reporting officer, Deputy Rick Reamer. On Monday, 110705, I, Deputy Rick Reamer, Unit Number 832 of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, was requested to return back to the scene. I assisted Sari Foskey, a patrol officer from the Kakana Police Department, and her bloodhound, Loof, with tracking. Foskey and I walked the Redant Quarry and field area on different tracks. We covered approximately 5 to 10 miles of tracking. 
One of the more significant tracks that Loof and Fosky tracked was from the south entry door of a red house trailer near the concrete stoop. This track did continue in a westerly direction towards a cul-de-sac at the end of Cuss Road. It was indicated by Fosky that Loof was very intense on this track. Deputy Rick Reamer, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 139. Type of Activity Supplemental Report. Date of Activity 110705. Reporting Officer, Deputy Joseph M. Tenner. Citizen Contact, Jeffrey J. Barda. Date of birth, 04-1185. Paul R. Hensinja. Date of birth, 06-2267. On 11.0705 at approximately 11.25 hours, I, Deputy Joseph M. Tinner of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, was posted on the southeast corner of the Avery property. One of the search groups reached my area. They were checking in an area south of my location. Jeffrey J. Barta, date of birth 04-1185, located a white sock. The bottom of the sock was blue. The sock was located near a creek approximately 30 feet south of the conveyor. This area was marked with a traffic cone. On 110705, at approximately 1135, firefighters Paul Huzinja, date of birth 06 located four shotgun shells. These shells were approximately 30 inches south of the conveyor near a, an entrance to a gravel pit. These shells were approximately 20 feet east of the sock. These shells were red plastic and a shiny aluminum. The shells did not show any sign of rust. They appeared to have been placed there recently. The area where these shells were located was marked with cones. I, rem I remained in the vicinity to monitor the sock and shotgun shell locations until Corporal Lieutenant Lemieux of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department relieved me. Joseph M. Tenner, Deputy, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 140. Type of Activity Interview of Lisa K. Buckner. Date of Activity 110705. Reporting Officer Investigator Mark Wiegert. On 110705 at 12 o'clock p.m., I, Investigator Mark Wiegert of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, met with Lisa Buckner inside the command post at the Avery property. Lisa informed me she was a school bus driver and would pick up several children at the Avery property and drop them off. Lisa stayed sometime between Monday, 10.31.05 and Wednesday, 11.02.05. She saw a female taking pictures around 3.30 p.m. I asked Lisa if she could be more specific as to the date to which she stated she could not. She just knows it was sometime either Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Lisa told me she drops off the two boys that live down the lane. She believes her names are Brendan and Blaine Dassey. She states she comes down Avery Lane and drops them off at the beginning of the driveway, which goes to the west. Lisa states she remembers a van being parked at the entrance to the driveway pointed eastbound. She states a van would have been parked at the intersection of Avery Lane and the driveway on the north side of the road, again pointed east. She stated the unknown female was standing in the grass north of where the van would have been parked, taking pictures. Lisa stated to me, I thought to myself, why would anyone take pictures of that junk? I asked Lisa if anyone was with the female. She stated she did not recall anyone being with her. She states there was a Grand Prix and a truck also parked in that area. She stated it's the same two vehicles that are parked there now. However, the van was not there now. I asked Lisa if she observed the two boys talking or associating with the female, to which Lisa stated she does not remember if they talked to her or not when they got off the bus. I asked Lisa if she knew anything about the weather that day, to which she stated she does not remember anything about the weather. Lisa indicated nothing about the day stands out. She stated she just remembered that this on Saturday, 11.05.05, and thought it would be important that we know this information. That was the end of my conversation with Lisa. All right, let's go ahead and do our review. We're going to start with page 132 today. And if you scroll down here, we're going to look at a list of 11 firearms taken from the Barb Yonda's residence by Colburn Link and Tyson.
Now the first one I want to talk about is number one, and that's the Sturm Ruger 223 caliber firearm. And you'll note that it has a bushnell scope, but more importantly, it is has an ammunition clip that was loaded with three rounds still in it. So that is a decision you make if you store your gun with rounds ready to go in it or if you unload them for safety. So I find that interesting that we still have ammunition and it was full, it was loaded with three rounds. But then we've got, you know, 12 gauge shotgun, we've got a 30 out 6 semi-automatic, uh, bolt action Mosser, we've got a 16 gauge single shot, which is a shotgun, we have a Marlin rifle. But no, this is bolt action, so this is not exactly the same as Stevens. Um, we're looking for a semi-automatic. So we'll go to number 750 caliber, muzzle loader, 16 gauge bolt action, 22 caliber Miami. Okay, so it's 22 caliber Miami, but it's a handgun, different gun, same bullet, but okay. Uh, 12 gauge pump shotgun, nope. Bingo, we're on the 11th weapon. I know it says 12, but if you look, 10 is ammunition. So we'll go back. On the 11th gun, we get a 22 caliber semi-automatic Marlin rifle. Now this was collected. It was located in the west bedroom, and it was collected by Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Link at 1454. And they did get some other rounds out of that bedroom as well. So that's interesting because that gun whose bedroom that is, would have had the exact same gun as what the state is saying was the murder weapon for the victim. So then they say after clearing from Barb Yonda's residence, they were notified uh, by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab was on the scene at Cuss, and they're requested to come back. So they dig the area up, and in doing it, they quickly find out this was not a possible grave or a burial site. So Dietering takes down the crime tape, and... They remove that and they open the area back up. Or do they? Because that's not what I see on this this photograph back on the Google Earth day that this was taken when they were down on Cuss Road. So let's take a look at that photograph. So you can see there's quite a bit of activity down here on Cuss Road. Now I'm going to broaden it out so you can see how many cars are there that aren't in the picture. But I did a close up here. This is the cul-de-sac at Cuss Road, and this is what they're saying is no big deal. So they're talking about some dig site. I'm not sure where, but look at this kidney-shaped black space on the ground with all these people. And then what do we have here? This appears to be like a very blue Jeep-like vehicle. You can see a white vehicle. Is the door open here on the end? I'm not sure, but does that not look like a bluish greenish vehicle sitting there possibly the rav and this is something dumped out and burnt here um, it's very very black so let's go ahead and zoom out and you can clearly see that we have several large black vehicles all in a row here and that this is quite a bit more impressive than they're making it out to be in the report something is in the middle of this road that is very substantially dark in color and everybody is focused around it so what went on there i mean what it appears to be is something was burnt there and what are we looking for in this case the original burn site and what does that look like possibly a bluish greenish sports utility you know suv for real so what really happened on cuss road you guys so to me it looked like um there was a lot more going on than them digging possibly in some dirt there looked like there was a lot going on and possibly the other link and colburn were the distraction just my personal opinion. Let's go to page 135, and we've got approximately 1.15 p.m. that Wendy Baldwin is now guarding the garbage burn barrel at Stephen Avery's house. And um, I find that interesting because isn't she the one that found the bloody rag? Um, you know, I don't even hear that she turns the bloody rag into evidence. And then 
here's where we get those search warrants that are going to be given to Wiegert. But then he gives them to the other fella and they they get rescinded and a new batch comes out. So what's wrong with what we've got here? Let's look at this. So we've got Alan Avery, Brian Dessy, Charles Avery, Bobby Dessy, Dolores Avery, Barbara Yonda, Earl Avery, and Stephen Avery. Well, what about Scott Tedich? He's not on the list. Why is it he on the list? He's there. We know that now. And uh, let's see, page 136. This is very interesting. So this Michelle um, Ganselberger, she actually was engaged to Earl Avery for two years. And she goes on to say she's really familiar with the property. But she also states that um, Steve is not the only fam family member capable of this sort of behavior. So who is she talking about? We've got Chuck and we've got Earl. She wouldn't really know back in 89 the others. It's just, who is she referring to? And then 137, we're back on Cuss Road again. And this time it's from it's Dietering's perspective. And he's talking to Michael Bushman. Now he's retired. It says it right here. So those people that say, well, he wasn't retired. We're just going by what Dietering said here. Uh, Michael Bushman comes out of retirement and he's now leading a team of searchers in the area. Wait a minute, you guys. Where does he work from? Where did he retire from? Manitowoc County. Guess what? Michael Bushman was one of the arresting officers in 1985 for Steve Avery. He's a canine unit. Him and his dog, Duke, were the ones checking the perimeter in 1985 as Stephen Avery was getting arrested. Talk about conflict of interest, please. He should not be touching this place with a 10-foot pole. And yet, he's, he's right in the mix of it, leading a team of searchers. Unbelievable. Do not allow the coroner, God forbid, she wasn't even part of the 85 case, has nothing to do with it, can't be a conflict of interest in any way that is associated with the 1985 case, but she's not allowed, yet they'll get a retired officer that was the first original arresting officer, Stephen Avery, to lead the search team on Cuss Road, where we just got done looking at that burnt area, what looks to be like either state or FBI black vehicles. Just doesn't make any sense. Um, Dietering goes on to say, I was notified the excavation area was not pertinent to the case. Oh, of course not. Hmm. Killing me. You're killing me, Smalls. Okay, page 138. So, a lot of people are going to take this to mean Steve Avery's trailer, but we're not on the Avery property. So, pay close attention here. It's Sarah Fausk, and she's got, um, from the uh, Kokana Police Department, she's got her bloodhound, Loof. What they're doing is they're walking in the Randett Quarry, and they've covered approximately 5 to 10 miles of tracking. One or more significant tracks that Loof and Foss tracked was to from the south entry door of the Red House trailer near the concrete stoop. This track did continue in a westerly direction toward the cul-de-sac at the end of Cuss. What did we just get done talking about? Cuss Road with that big burn spot and all those vehicles. So let me get this straight. Where is Loof tracking from? Let's take a look. So here you can see an actual aerial shot of the Avery salvage yard. You can see the Redont quarry right here. Um, if you go way up in the corner at the top on the left hand side that is the start of the michael materials quarry and if you go all the way down here to where we see this red dot in the bottom left hand side you're going to see this little red trailer this is deer camp so that's the color of the trailer that's sitting there at deer camp and this is where Loof is tracking from the back door from to cul-de-sac. So let's look and see if we can get another picture that shows the deer camp location versus 
the cul-de-sac location to see where the dog has tracked. All right, you guys, so here's our map. <clears throat> and you can see I've put a um, little red place here, a little home. This is representative of representative of the red trailer home at the deer camp. And then you can see the yellow line is showing where the dog would have went. And it went right to Cuss Road. And what do you see down here? All of this. So dogs don't lie, you guys. What happened on Cuss Road? What did the retired deputy Bushman, the original arresting officer in the Avery case, find down on that road at the end of the cul-de-sac on Cuss Road? Let's continue on. Um, like I said, it says it was indicated by Faust that loop was very intense on this track. So that's the red trailer with the little concrete stoop that they're referring to because we know we're down at the Randit Quarry, which is where Deer Camp is. So we'll continue on to page 139. And this is Deputy Tenor who's talking to two individuals. And they are stating that they found a sock, a white sock. And this sock is down in um, the southeast corner of the Avery property. Is where the gentleman is stationed, but it states that they are located. The sock is a, at a creek approximately 30 feet from south of the conveyor. Okay, so if you really look at this, they're searching an area south of his location. So he's already at the southeast corner, which if you remember right, that would be past the Dassies. If you were looking at the burn barrels from the day before, we went southeast of the property and it took us toward the junkyard. And then if you continue on out of the property there and you, you are leaving the Avery property, you're heading towards, I believe, the Randant area. And what they find is they have a conveyor down there for gravel, and there's a sock near a creek located 30 feet from the conveyor. They also find um, another person, a firefighter, finds shells down there, fresh shells. So they weren't rusted and, and that they were still new, and that was down there, um, and that was very close to the whole area. So we're going to totally switch gears and we're going to end on a little bit of a different note because they take us to Lisa Buckner, which was a school bus driver on page 140. Mark Wiegert's investigator, this is on the 7th. So Lisa, the bus driver, is very confused here and I'm going to show you why. She talks about dropping the kids off, picking them off up every day, dropping them off around 3.30. Um, she states that she does this Monday and Wednesday. Um, or some time between Monday and Wednesday, she saw a female taking pictures around 3.30 p.m. Here's the problem. She goes along talking about the female taking pictures of the van, but she states there was a Grand Prix and a truck also parked in that area. She said it is the same two vehicles that are parked there now. However, the van was not there. So she's seeing that woman in a completely different location. Just so happens that the auto trader girl, Teresa, would have taken pictures up at that area at an earlier time frame. So this would have been a previous appointment. And so we lose the entire bus driver's account for the 31st because she is referring to the van parked next to the Grand Prix and the truck, which are also, also I can't talk today, also parked way, way, way away from where the van is by Stevens. So she didn't see the girl way down there. She saw the girl taking pictures where there were three vehicles located, which would have been a few weeks prior to the 31st. So on that note, we've debunked the entire bus driver's uh, witness account completely. She even does in testimony state that she can't be sure of the time frame. So I want to thank you for joining us on this week's read. So that concludes and wraps up our Daily Ma'am reading of the Cassio Investigative Reports part, uh, part 14. And I want to thank you all for joining me on that. And, um, you know, again, 
we're featuring uh, another day of some beautiful artwork by James S.B. 007 and he has created this very beautiful piece of work and it shows that you know everybody has a talent everybody has a gift in this and creating that public awareness and keeping them in the light so that the world is watching keeps them safe and I want to thank you individually for your support for Brendan um, and Stephen because they are wrongfully convicted and we see that in these reports it's getting to the point that it, it makes no sense how they thought they were going to get away from for all of this but then again who would have been watching right who was going to be paying attention to just a poor fella and his nephew well if you didn't do the crime you shouldn't do the time thank you guys and have a wonderful night